saying the child had a crooked penis. And I have a crooked penis. And I said, yes. She said, so how can you deny that this is your son? So she said, All I have to say is I hope nobody exact. brought an exhibit. See, whatever, good looking. My okay, bad. we had sex. It was a three minute thing. You know, three, I, minutes. three minutes. Three minutes. You done come to the wrong courtroom clowning. This is not a joke. It's nothing to dance about. It's nothing to laugh about. Your future was on the line because of your bad decisions. Now, you should be ashamed of yourself. Mr. Taylor shows off his social media dad skills with a series of, look at me, I'm a dad, posts. But the plot twist comes when Ms. Orr tells him to delete those proud papa posts faster than a teenager hides their browser history. It's a classic case of, I want you to be the dad, but only on my terms. Right, Your Honor, that was on her Facebook. And then the next one says, love my son. Yes, Your Honor. And then the I... next one says, first time me eating him. Mr. Taylor, I will say this. The posts you put on Facebook, they look like you do want to be a part of this child's life. If you are the biological father, you intend to be a part of baby Eric's life? I've been here since, like, since I found out about him. I was not raised up with my dad. I did not know of my dad until I was 14 years old. I don't think any child deserves to grow up without a dad. For the fact that she did not tell me until Eric was a week old, I am unbelievably shocked. I do not know why. This whole thing feels like a TV show gone wild. Here's where it gets sitcom level complicated. Mr. Taylor gets all mushy at the hospital, snapping pics like a tourist. Yet, Ms. Orr flips the script and gives him the stop sharing our baby's pics or speech. Imagine being told to share and then, psych, don't share. You won't believe what's up next. You're at the hospital. You take these beautiful photos, right. post them up. What happens at the hospital that would make you retract all of this? For the fact that she had made me have doubt because she told me to take the pictures up her son off Facebook. Your Honor, she's basically harassed me that this is nothing but my child. I have known from day one, this is your child. She has messaged me constantly, this is your child. Why won't you answer the phone for your child? Yes, I and have. And then you she put the pictures said, up of hey, your child and she tells you to take right. them down can't make this stuff up, Ms. Orr, in a move that would make soap opera writers proud, sends Mr. Taylor a babyface mashup, suggesting their son looks nothing like her ex. Mr. Taylor, now doubting his role in this baby saga, wonders if he's more of a guest star than a main cast member. Stay tuned, the next part is even crazier. Picture of a comparison that she had sent me of me. Let me see that, Jerome. And Eric. And another to Eric. That's you on the bottom right. That's baby right. Eric in the corners. Yes, Your Honor. And another man is on the top left. Yes, Your Honor. Why do you send them a collage of pictures with the baby and another man? To let him know Eric does not look like another man. Where'd you pull this man out of, thin air? No, Your Honor. That is one of my ex. Your Honor, okay. that's the reason why I've been so, asking for DNA. Okay. And this is someone Mr. Taylor was accusing you of having sex with as well. This could possibly be baby Eric's biological father. Did they really just go there? In a plot twist no one saw coming, Ms. Orr claims their baby's unique physical feature should clear any doubt about paternity. It's like saying, he has your eyes and also, apparently, your crooked penis. Talk about awkward family resemblances. Oh, but wait, it gets weirder. Saying the child had a crooked penis. And I have a crooked penis. And I said, yes. She said, so how can you deny that this is your son? So she said, All I have to say is I hope nobody exact. brought an exhibit. <laughs> Your Honor, my son could not get circumcised because he was over 90 degrees. Miss Orr, did you say that your baby has a crooked penis? And that was a point of proof. No, Your Honor, not a point She's of lying, proof. You're lying, Your Honor. They let him know that his son is going to be having surgery in August. Then why was she asked? Is that how you took it, Mr. Taylor? Why was she asked? just when you thought it couldn't get any stranger. The court calls in Dr. Richardson to debunk the myth that a crooked tingy lingy is the family crest of the Taylor lineage. It turns out genetics is more complicated than a simple bend to the left or right. And guess what? The next bit is the cherry on top. The grand finale reveals Mr. Taylor is. In the case of Taylor versus Orr, when it comes to six week old Eric Orr, it has been determined by this court. Mr. Taylor, you are not father. <laughs>
Ms. Myers drags her mom, Ms. Madrigal, into court, dropping a bombshell that her mom's memory of her biological dad is as clear as mud. She whips out a list of 13 possible dads, turning the court into a bizarre bingo game, hoping to hit the jackpot and find her real pops. But hold your breath, because the drama is just escalating. And if you think that's jaw-dropping, just wait for what's coming up. Ms. Myers, uh, you have brought your mother, Ms. Madrigal, to court today because you claim she has no idea who your biological father is. You say your mother gave you a list of 13 possible men and you are hoping to determine who your father is today. The court has located two of the 13 men and has already ordered paternity tests. Miss Myers, getting real for a moment, lays it all out, sharing her soul-crushing saga of not knowing her dad, sparking an intense mother-daughter showdown. They dive deep into the tear-jerking drama of who should have done what, turning the courtroom into an episode of Family Feud. Just when you think you've seen it all, the next moment will have you on the edge of your seat. The next chapter of this saga will definitely surprise you. I feel lost. You know, I feel confused. I don't know who I am. I don't know my heritage. I don't know what I'm completely mixed with. I don't know where I came from. I don't know nothing. He came for me. It doesn't family, matter. But that's only half Nobody the story. Nobody else matters. Can't no, half man, the story. can't no man raise me better than you can, even though it doesn't even matter. You raised so me? Save, you raised me? Oh, I raised you. No, you didn't. I raised you. You weren't even there. So any stop Ms. Myers, it. you claim that you left home when you were 15 years old. Yeah, I did. Mr. McCraney spills the beans about his fleeting meetup with Ms. Madrigal and his skepticism about his role in the whole Who's Your Daddy saga with Ms. Myers. This confession had the courtroom roaring with laughter, turning the solemn atmosphere into something resembling a sitcom scene as everyone pondered just how brief brief could be. But just wait, the plot is about to thicken even more. Stay tuned, because what happens next is truly unexpected. Get the witness for me, Mr. Keith McCraney and his daughter, Carmen. Oh, great. I cannot believe it. I... You do know Ms. Meyer's mom, Ms. Matt. Yes, I do. Please state how you met her. You know, we got together. She came over, told me she thought I was sexy, whatever, good looking. My okay, bad. we had sex. It was a three minute thing. You know, three, I... minutes. three minutes. Three minutes. Myers, feeling like she's the target of a roast rather than a court case, hits her emotional limit. This leads to a courtroom drama worthy of primetime TV, with the judge stepping in to play the role of a reluctant referee, urging everyone to get a grip and remember they're here to untangle the paternity pretzel, not to audition for a soap opera. The following twist in the story will leave you questioning everything. Brace yourself for the next reveal. It's a game changer. These guys, everybody's attacking me like I'm the one that was laying down sleeping with people. I'm the one that was made. Uh, Miss Myers, okay? I Look at me, look at me. I understand you're hurt. There's not a person sitting in here today that could imagine being in your position. Tell me what you feel. The moment of truth arrives with all the suspense of a season finale cliffhanger. Mr. Keith McCraney, it has been determined by this court that are the father. There it is. <laughs> Did you faint, Mr. Ooh. McCraney? I, I, I don't believe that at all. Whoa. No, I, they must have got their test mixed up. You or something. are the father. The pleasantries exchanged between the judge and the courtroom crew are so warm, you'd think they were about to share a Thanksgiving dinner, not delve into the legal drama of Adams versus Williams. Just when you thought courtroom dramas couldn't get any more electrifying, hold on for what's coming up next, and trust me, you haven't seen anything yet. Hello, Your Honor. Hello. This is a case of Adams versus Williams. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. Adams, you say you're here today regarding a matter of extreme urgency. Miss Williams, with the sass of a daytime TV judge and the determination of a mom on a mission, counters, asserting Mr. Adams is indeed the biological father of her three-year-old son, who, according to her, has inherited his dad's inability to put the toilet seat down. She criticizes Mr. Adams for his absence in their son's life, noting that even a cactus requires less attention but somehow gets more from Mr. Adams. You won't believe the twist that's about to unfold. The courtroom is about to get even more heated. Just you wait. You say Mr. Adams is indeed your baby his biological father and you argue his legal issues are his own fault because he never stepped up for his son. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Adams is joining us from WBSF 46, the CW in Flint, Michigan, and we'll hear from you in a moment, sir. The court then hears from Mr. Adams' mother, who, armed with family photos and a tone that could guilt trip a saint, outlines the legal and emotional turmoil tearing through their lives like a tornado in a trailer park thanks to the paternity dispute and looming child support obligations that could rival a small country's GDP. But the drama doesn't stop there. The next segment will have you on the edge of your seat. The tension mounts, and what follows is truly unprecedented. Your Honor, my son is now facing jail because of this situation. This very moment, you're concerned that he could be arrested for failure to pay child support yes. for a child that both of you have doubts is even his child. True, Your Honor. 
As the tension escalates, the courtroom turns into a soap opera set with personal accusations and defenses flying faster than insults at a family reunion. The emotional and legal stakes couldn't be higher if they tried, including missed DNA testing opportunities that have everyone wondering if Mori Povich might just pop out to lend a hand with his infamous paternity test results. Believe it or not, what happens next is even more jaw-dropping. Prepare to have your expectations shattered in the next scene. Adams, did you go to court? No, Your Honor, only due to the fact that I was incarcerated, so I didn't receive any court subpoenas, anything, Your Honor, I was incarcerated. I guess they were supposed to meet or whatever, and she must have met up with some guys. That's a lie. And she and my daughter was talking, and the question came up again, was my son the father of the child? And she said no, and she's over there talking about it's a lie, and she was in my very own living room, and I seen her. She was with a guy. She was around nine months pregnant. The episode deep dives into personal testimonies and confrontations, reminding everyone that proving paternity is trickier than navigating a corn maze blindfolded. The spotlight on the impact of personal decisions on legal outcomes shines brighter than a neon sign at Vegas, emphasizing the emotional toll on all parties involved. It's a roller coaster of emotions, with the child's well being and identity hanging in the balance, making everyone question their life choices and why they didn't just stick to watching cat videos on the internet. You'll want to stay tuned because the conclusion is something no one saw coming. But wait, there's more. The final revelation is just around the corner. Mr. Know, Adams, when you look at Baby John, do you see yourself? I mean, honestly, no, Your Honor, because you know, I spent, ch I spent time around this child. If he was really my son, Son, you know, I think we had that bond, that connection. It has been determined that Mr. Adams is not the father. <laughs> Take me off child support, baby. You done come to the wrong courtroom clowning. This is not a joke. It's nothing to dance about. It's nothing to laugh about. Your future was on the line because of your bad decision. So Judge Lake dives into the deep end, asking about the beginnings of Ms. Hanger and Mr. Babbitt's are we or aren't we relationship saga, including a cheeky check on their commitment level and a hem protective measures during their romantic escapades. Ms. Hanger spills the tea on how their love story was pretty much like a rom-com, minus the comedy, meeting through a roommate, bonding over video games and music, and eventually taking the plunge into intimacy, all with a carefree, read protection free spirit. Meanwhile, Mr. Babbitt throws a curveball, suspecting Ms. Hanger was also playing co op mode with the other roommate, thanks to some awkward comments and jealousy vibes. Picture this a love triangle drama unfolding with video games as the backdrop, and you've got yourself a Netflix special in the making. This relationship began. Was it committed? Were you also sleeping with other people? I met him through my roommate. He'd hung out a couple of times, played video games, listened to music, all that stuff, and then everything went on from there. So the bottom line is you two were intimate. Yes. At some point. Yes. Did you use protection? No, never. When Ms. Hanger drops the bomb about being pregnant, it's like the plot thickens and we're suddenly in a daytime soap opera. She's all in, swearing Mr. Babbitt's the only player in her game for the past year. But he's on the fence, giving side eye to the pregnancy test she presents. Cue the dramatic music as Mr. Babbitt demands a retest, fearing some ghetto hood rat stuff, which is his way of saying he wouldn't trust a pregnancy test unless it was done under lab conditions, or perhaps by a team of scientists. It's like watching a tennis match of accusations and disbelief. Only the ball is a potential baby, and the players are not quite ready for the grand slam of parenthood. When you found out you were pregnant, you told Mr. Babbitt because that was the only person you were sleeping with? Yes, I had not slept, slept with anybody else to him for a year with my ex-boyfriend. So you had never slept with I anybody had else but Mr. Nice Babbitt man. during that window of time? Month. Well, you were sneaking out in the middle of the night doing something. Not sneaking you out anywhere. The only time I'd get out of bed up. is to go to the bed. Yes, and you wouldn't come back for an hour. No. So you would no. be asleep and then she would climb out of the bed and not come back for an hour? Yeah. I mean, sometimes 30 or 40 minutes, but it's a long... No. And that's when you thought she was also she was with the roommate. That's, and that's yeah, because I start piecing together, I'm like, well, he said no. this, but that could have been a past relationship thing. Fast forward to a medical appointment that feels more suspenseful than waiting for the season finale cliffhanger resolution of your favorite show. Mr. Babbitt's already packing his bags mentally when the heartbeat plays hard to get on the monitor, convinced the pregnancy is a primetime sham. He jets off, missing future appointments and the birth, effectively ghosting Ms. Hanger and his unborn child, like a bad Tinder date that went too far. Imagine Mr. Babbitt on a plane, sipping a tiny beverage, pondering the mysteries of life, while Ms. Hanger is left starring in her own one-woman show titled Maybe Baby. I went to the doctor's appointment with her to get the ultrasound done. They're sitting there, they're doing this ultrasound, and the nurse is sitting there, okay, we're gonna find that heartbeat. And then the nurse is kind of going over her stomach. It wasn't an ultrasound, it was a fetal Doppler. Two different things. Well, anyway, it's supposed to detect at six weeks and you're seven and a half, and the nurse told me no, so that was my medical. She's, wait, let me get this. So when 
when you were at that appointment, Mr. Babbitt, and it was hard for her to detect a heartbeat, at all. you said, she's not pregnant. Yes. And then that's why you went on ahead and went out of town, because in your mind, you I thought it. there was no pregnancy. Well, but for one, I am a bigger, I'm a, I'm a bigger lady. It does take a little bit harder to detect things when you're a certain amount of weeks pregnant. You were there by yourself. Mr. Babbitt was not there? No. All right. This is a Did girl you girl. let him know? Did yeah, you... I let him know. I had to go get induced. Yeah, you're um, like, I'm having and then I got tonight. Tonight. And Wait, it, no, I'm not. In court, the drama unfolds like a telenovela with a twist of Maury Povich, complete with emotional breakdowns, family betrayals, and the kind of paternity drama that would make even daytime TV blush. Evidence flies across the courtroom like confetti, from sassy letters to family testimonials, all aiming to untangle this messy web of who's the daddy. Amidst the chaos, Judge Lake decides it's time for a lie detector test, because nothing says I might be the father, like sweating bullets over a machine that's seen more drama than a high school prom. And just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, accusations of baby stealing and Facebook shenanigans throw us into a loop, proving life is indeed stranger than fiction. Royce Babbitt, the defendant, he writes back, that's great, maybe they have you committed, cause you have to be crazy if you think I'm coming up there for a baby I don't believe is mine. Because I never proved to him that I was pregnant. No, what I thought could have happened is as crazy as you are, you might have been up there doing something in the hospital, not pregnancy related. A hospital bed, I had a cesarean. I had an emergency C-section the second time I got induced. Up until this point, from the time you went to Florida until the time you had this baby, you all weren't speaking, he wasn't involved? No, we started semi-talking on Facebook only to come over to my house to talk in person. Yeah, I walked in and there. And that makes like, you emotional. Why, what, what why are you feeling emotional, Miss Hanger? What are you feeling? <laughs> that my daughter has to go without her father because I went through that. The big reveal of the DNA results is like the season finale where all is finally revealed. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Royce Babbitt, you are her father. Oops, I guess. Huh? All I want is an apology for her. I don't owe you any apology. Definitely you owe me an apology for denying voice. her. Come on, dude. It's, I've it's told you child. from day one. Yeah, it's my child now, but it wasn't then. I mean, I can have been your child since conception. All right. He doesn't do anything for my child. That's I have true, to take Honor. care of my child by myself. True, Excuse me, I'm that talking. Is not true, Your Honor. I am talking. You do not that interrupt not true, me when I'm talking. Okay, Shut let's, your mouth. Let's right now. down. Oh, there is a picture in my bed with someone else. A picture of Mr. Adel in the bed with somebody else, your bed? That's why you cheated, because you saw that picture, so then you went out and did it. Absolutely. You're really the reason your son is dead. I'm not the reason he's listen, dead. Listen, listen, lady. You're the reason. If he you know that. Come on. Girl, do baby, it. tell do you it. something. If he Miss wasn't ladies. with your trashy self, first he did the border. The case of Taylor and Johnson versus Barber kicks off with a scenario that sounds more like a plot twist from a daytime soap opera than a courtroom drama. The plaintiffs, Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson, claim they both magically got pregnant at the same time by the defendant, Mr. Barber, who seems to have been busier than a bee in spring. They argue that Mr. Barber has been more of a Houdini than a father, disappearing when it comes to supporting their children financially. Ms. Taylor and Ms. Johnson, you both claim that you were pregnant at the same time with yes. the defendant, Mr. Barber's children. Yes, yes Your Honor. You argue that he has not been a father to your kids and refuses to support them, but takes now, the drama unfolds in a way you'd least expect. Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson are suing Mr. Barber for childcare expenses, totaling three six or and three thousand eighteen hundred and eighty dollars, respectively. Which sounds like they're trying to finance a small pirate expedition rather than raise children. Mr. Barber counters by claiming he's on the verge of selling an organ or two, unable to support the children due to the plaintiff's demands, which are as excessive as a dragon's appetite for gold. Accompanied by drama levels that could win them an Oscar. Just when you think you've seen it all, the courtroom becomes the stage for even more astonishing revelations. Ms. Taylor, you are suing Mr. Barber for $3,608. You are also asking the court to award you $3,880 in child care expenses. Yes, Your Honor. In a scene is straight out of a primitive drama, the plaintiffs accuse Mr. Barber of playing favorites, only supporting his other child because he's still in cahoots with that child's mother. This accusation sparks a heated argument, reminiscent of a reality TV show showdown, with the judge stepping in like a referee in a wrestling match to maintain order. But keep your eyes peeled. The twists and turns are just getting started. I believe that he supports his other child because he's still sleeping with his other child's mother. I have true, to Your take Honor. care of my child that by myself. True, Excuse me, I'm that talking. That is not true, Your Honor. I am talking. You do not that interrupt not true, me Your when Honor. I'm talking. Okay, Shut your mouth. I've been having to take care of my child on my own for the last five 
weird. As if scripted by a master storyteller, the court session takes a turn for the sitcom when Mr. Barber receives a phone call, leading to an eruption of laughter and applause from the audience. The judge, channeling his inner comedian, suggests checking if the caller is another woman, adding a plot twist that not even Mr. Barber saw coming. You won't believe what happens next in this roller coaster of emotions and laughter. Uh, Mr. Go. Barber, is somebody <laughs> calling you? <laughs> Jerome, answer it and see if it's a woman. Sorry, no. They probably never call back again if they find out she's in fraternity court. In a breathtaking moment, Mr. Barber drops a bombshell, admitting he's the father of all the children involved and has even autographed their birth certificates, like their memorabilia. The discussion about his presence during the births and his emotional Oscars-worthy performance when confronted about his absence at one of the deliveries adds more layers to his already complex character study. The next scene is even more gripping, as the judge brings a new perspective to the table. So if I saw the birth certificates... I've, I've signed every... Ms. Johnson? Yeah, he's on mine. Oh Ms. Taylor? Taylor? Cut the umbilical cord and everything. What? Yeah, did he cut the umbilical cord for you? Oh, how about you, Cash? Oh, you done started oh, okay. something now. With wisdom that cuts through the chaos, Judge Lake takes the stage, emphasizing the importance of communication, responsibility, and the need for a sitcom-style resolution that prioritizes the well-being of the children over the adult drama, which has enough material to start its own spin-off series. The saga continues with more unexpected turns that will leave you on the edge of your seat. I also see how frustrated Mr. Barber is. I see a man who's admitting pretty much I blew it. But when you two go to speak, I took a moment to just observe you. I I mean, you go to not level 10, level 20 in a matter of two seconds, and you all make me uncomfortable watching you yell and scream. In a revealing spotlight, the focus turns to Mr. Barber's financial contributions, or the lack thereof, which makes the two packs of diapers he bought seem like a desperate attempt at a peace offering. Miss Taylor and Miss Johnson share their tales of minimal support, which could easily be the plot for a tragic comedy skit. But just when you think you've heard it all, the story deepens with even more intrigue. Have you sent Miss Taylor or Miss Johnson any money Recently? consistently? Consistently, no, ma'am. Miss Taylor, he bought my daughter two packs of diapers. And how old is your daughter? My never daughter is five years old. And Miss Johnson, you saying you never got? He never bought my son no diapers. I may do whatever I had to do to get my. The courtroom is thrust into the realm of a telenovela when it's revealed Mr. Barber had three women pregnant at the same time, turning the courtroom into a scene straight out of a telenovela, complete with gasps from the audience and dramatic background music. The drama escalates to new heights, setting the stage for a verdict that will leave everyone talking. You know, it is this court's opinion that Miss Taylor is in fact entitled to $3,608 in back child care expenses. <laughs> Moving on. Did you also bring receipts? Yes, I bring receipts. And information for and the court regarding your claim? Yes. Is it for the uniform? School uniform. For school, diapers. These expenses are all reasonable and legitimate. Seeing as though you have acknowledged this child, signed his birth certificate, you have a responsibility. The case of Adel versus Jones kicks off with the court clerk spicing up the courtroom, introducing a story juicier than a primetime soap opera. Mr. Adel, feeling more betrayed than when he finds out his favorite show was canceled, alleges Ms. Jones pulled a fast one on him by getting him to sign the birth certificate of her daughter, Jasala, amidst a backdrop of infidelity. Mr. Adel, you are here today to prove Ms. Jones committed paternity fraud. You claim Ms. Jones duped you into signing her daughter's birth certificate only to find out after her child was born that she cheated prior to getting pregnant. You say she broke the terms of your relationship. Is that correct? Mr. Adel, diving into the nitty gritty, reveals their swinging lifestyle, accusing Ms. Jones of stepping out of bounds by having a rendezvous without him as her wingman. He's convinced Ms. Jones is trying to make him the fall guy for her baby, sparking a debate over the do's and don'ts of their open relationship playbook, which apparently included a strict no solo flights policy and an iron clad commitment to protection. What do you mean she broke the terms of the relationship? We have certain rules. We're swingers, you know, and um, okay. And she went outside of the relationship. She cheated on me, and now she's trying to pin the baby on me. So wait, you have swinger rules? Yes, ma'am. What are the rules? What are the terms? The rules are you don't you don't go outside of the relationship and have have uh, sexual relations with anyone outside of the relationship unless the other one is present. 
Miss Jones owns up to her mischief, confessing to cheating as a comeback for Mr. Addle's suspected escapades. She maintains she armored up during her act of spite, which was set off by stumbling upon a photo of Mr. Addle that screamed guilty. This tit-for-tat move had her channeling her inner soap opera villain, seeking revenge with the finesse of a scorned telenovela star. He cheated too, though. I did out of spite. You did it out of spite. You yeah. feel like he cheated. Your Honor, she's, she swears to God I cheated, and I, 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 don't, I don't cheat. Oh, there was a picture in my bed with someone else. A picture of Mr. Adel in the bed with somebody else? Your bed? Yes, Your Honor. And that's why you cheated, because you saw that picture, so then you went out and did it. Absolutely. Now we know two wrongs never make a right. It just makes drama. The tale takes us back to how this dynamic duo first crossed paths and took a dive into the swingers' pool, with Mr. Adel playing the role of the seasoned guide. Despite Ms. Jones's initial reservations, akin to dipping her toes into ice-cold water, she plunged into the lifestyle, aiming to score brownie points with Mr. Adel, which led to their memorable, albeit awkward, first threesome. At first, I thought he was crazy. Why would you want to sleep with somebody else other than your loved one? Because That's it's what I'm thinking. It's exciting. But I gave it a chance because I loved him. So the first time you all have this threesome, what happened? I mean, I know what happens, I guess, but... <laughs> I, well, I really don't, but I, I don't know if I want to know. The plot thickens with the mystery of Jasala's paternity taking center stage amidst the backdrop of their unconventional relationship dynamics. Ms. Jones admits to a steamy encounter with another player during one of their swinging soirees, but stands her ground on the protection protocol, throwing a curveball into the paternity puzzle. What happened with this other man? Why decide to have sex with this other man? I felt neglected. He wasn't home. He would leave many hours of the night, sometimes even days. And when I would ask him where he was, he would tell me it's none of my business. Business. So, I turned around and went out with one of his friends, had a couple drinks, and one thing led to the next. We used a condom, I remember, and when I told them there may not be a possibility, I was trying to get under his skin. In a twist worthy of a season finale cliffhanger, the courtroom holds its breath as the DNA results are unveiled. The air buzzes with a mix of shock, tears, and a sudden rush of reality, hitting harder than a poorly timed sitcom laugh track as everyone processes this life-altering news. If she is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the man I need to be. I'm gonna be there for her and we're gonna, we're gonna start a, we're gonna start a life. When you say start a life, do you two want to have a relationship together? I, I, I loved her since the day I met her, you know, and I'd, I'd like to move on with her. I'd like to be, I'd like to still be in a relationship with her. And I, I can't bl blame her 100%, but I, I need to know if that's my baby or not. I'm glad you can admit that. I think it's time for the results. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Adel, you are the father. I told you. The episode starts with the kind of drama that could put daytime soap operas to shame, featuring the case of Banks versus Hawkins. Miss Banks is throwing shade faster than a cloudy day in Seattle, claiming Miss Hawkins is pinning her baby on Banks' late son, Daryl, like he's some kind of posthumous paternity pinata. On the flip side, Miss Hawkins is standing her ground, insisting Daryl is the daddy, and accusing Miss Banks of trying to erase her son's legacy as if she's got a giant cosmic eraser. Miss Banks, you say the defendant is pinning her baby on your son, Daryl, who was trapped tragically murdered before her child was born. You say Daryl told you he didn't believe he was the father, and you intend to prove that today. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Hawkins, you state Ms. Banks is denying her son's legacy, Jasani, and you claim today's DNA results will prove Daryl is the father. Is yes, that correct? Your Honor. Miss Banks dives into her sea of skepticism, not convinced that Dasani, who, by the way, shares a name with a brand of bottled water, adding an unexpected layer of hydration to the drama, is her grandson. She talks about her bond with Daryl, who apparently had more doubts than a conspiracy theorist at a science convention. She paints a picture of Daryl and Miss Hawkins' roller coaster romance, complete with other women popping up like whack a moles, claiming Daryl's the father of their kids, too. It's like a Maury Povich show, but with more plot twists. I don't believe that Jashani is my grandson, and I'm here to prove it today. For for the simple fact that Jada and my son had a very rocky relationship. We were just were really close. We talked all the time. He would just call me to tell me that he loved me. They kept breaking up. So when my son told me about this, I told him that I was going to get a DNA. And the type of person my son was, if he really believed that Miss Jada had his baby, he would have said to me, no, mom, no. 
Miss Hawkins steps up to the plate, swinging for the fences, with her love story with Daryl portraying a romance that could make Romeo and Juliet look like a casual fling. She's laying down the timeline of their relationship with the precision of a Swiss watch, trying to debunk Miss Banks' skepticism as if she's a mythbuster dealing with relationship rumors. This is her chance to prove that her connection with Daryl was more than just a fling. It was a marathon of love, not a sprint. Daryl and I had a strong relationship. We were, we were on and off. I loved him very much. He loved me very much. When I told him I was pregnant, he wanted me to keep it. We were we got back together and we started working on it. And so if you got pregnant during the time you broke up and you were seeing someone else, could this other person potentially be your child's father? No, no, Your Honor, because I was only with someone else for two weeks. I found that I was pregnant. I was about six weeks pregnant. So you feel like you were already pregnant before you and Daryl broke, broke up? up yes. Yeah. Miss Banks tells the tale of how she found out about Miss Hawkins' bun in the oven, which apparently was more surprising than finding out your quiet neighbor is a karaoke champion. This bombshell led to a who's the daddy debate that could rival any primetime mystery show, turning the whole scenario into a game of Clue, where everyone's guessing who the father is with the enthusiasm of a detective on their third cup of coffee. He came to me, he called me on the phone, and he was like, Mom, Jada's pregnant. And I was like, who is Jada? And he was like, she's my new girlfriend. And I was like, oh, here we go again. My son had a lot of girlfriends. And to me, Jada was just another girl that came along, and now she's saying she's pregnant. Of course, Daryl was gonna be like, he wants to have a baby. He comes from a large family. So how was it that he expressed that he was doubtful? When she called and said that she was pregnant, she was living with another man. Oh. Correct. Oh. I was not living with another man. I was staying with my cousin. I was in a relationship with another man. And when I found that I was pregnant, the other man said, if you decide to keep the baby, let's end the relationship. That's how I ended back up with Daryl. So you came back to my son because another man didn't want you? Because I wanted my baby, and Daryl wanted my baby too. The courtroom heats up faster than a microwave meal, with Miss Banks and Miss Hawkins slinging accusations like they're in a food fight, mm, but with words. The air is so tense you could cut it with a knife or perhaps a gavel. This verbal tug of war pulls at the heartstrings and the laugh lines as the situation's absurdity unfolds like a dramatic origami. You're really the reason your son is dead. I'm not the reason he's listen, dead. Listen, listen, ladies. You're the reason. If he you ladies, know that. You ladies. Know Come on. Girl, do baby, it. Tell do you it. If he Let wasn't ladies, with your trashy self, first of all, let's get some order. Let's there. get some order, ladies. Why would you name him Jay Shani when you know that my son is dead? The whole time you were pregnant, you told us you were gonna let name that speak. baby Daryl Ray Daniel I'm the let third. You speak. In a twist that's part heartfelt and part head scratching, Miss Banks extends an olive branch or maybe a whole olive tree, inviting Miss Hawkins and the kiddo to move closer. This gesture is more complex than a lasagna, showing Miss Banks's tangled web of hope, skepticism and a dash of unexpected hospitality. It's like she's saying, I might doubt you, but let's be neighbors. Once he passes, do you try to form a relationship with Miss Hoff? Yes, I try to form a relationship with her because I knew Jada's situation. I have a bunch of kids. I have a house. So I talked to Jada on the phone and I said to her, well, Jada, come on. Move to Houston with us. I can help you better if you live close to me. I bought Jada a one-way ticket. Yes, it was a one-way ticket because you were supposed to be coming. I get to the airport with balloons in my hand, excited because this is all that I have left. I'm standing in the airport like an idiot. This one's nowhere around. And then, the moment of truth. The DNA results come in, shining brighter than a spotlight on a stage. It has been determined by this court the percentage of relatedness between Miss Lewinda Banks and Jasani Daniel is 99.99% you are related. <laughs> The case kicks off with Ms. Hayes dropping the bombshell that her sister might be the mother of her husband's child, after a decade of marriage no less. She's all set for a paternity showdown, warning her sister of an impending soap opera level drama if the kid turns out to be her husband's. Ms. Hayes, playing defense, is unfazed, ready to bet her last dollar on the paternity test and plotting a sister exit strategy post reveal. You say that your sister, the defendant, claims to have a child with your husband of 10 years and you have petitioned the court for a 
paternity test, and you are here to warn her that when he finds out her baby is not his today, she'll probably never hear from him again. Now, Ms. Hayes, you state that your sister is just jealous that you were able to have her husband's baby. Totally unexpected, right? Ms. Hayes caught her hubby and sister in a mega awkward moment, and it was like, oops, not this again, because her sister's always been a bit too close to her exes. The defendant just shrugged it off, leading to a wild chat about their crazy family photo album. Stick around, because the next bit is even juicier. How did your sister steal your husband? I came home and found him and her in our bed naked. I knew that they were sleeping together, but to put it in my face and be in my bed and me walk in and catch him naked, why would it be any different? She slept with my first husband and my second husband. You And I didn't even know about my second and she husband had me, until me around each of them in the and same you know, predicament. You won't believe this mess. We then hear about how the defendant's life was a roller coaster of oopsies, from addiction to being homeless, and how the plaintiff tried to be the superhero. They've got this weird love-hate thing going on, with betrayal, sisterly moments, and even the plaintiff helping deliver her niece or nephew. Just wait. It spirals even more out of control up next. I've had custody of this girl since she was 11. You know, the choices that she made between everything else. The latest time that I rescued you, I helped you get clean. Yes, Your Honor, I went she to did. Chicago after not hearing from her for seven years. I lost control of my life, myself, my morals, everything. When I got clean, got you every time you picked up a phone. When I call. got clean, I Who just I was you? I had been Who an addict and you? homeless for 15 dad. years. It wasn't your mom. And it I didn't know me. how to be it respectful. I didn't know how to be a woman. I didn't know how to be a lady. And when all this came about, I didn't go to my sister and say, I need sex or I feel lonely. We used to hang out in her room together, watch movies, whatever we would do. Just when you think it's all out in the open, things get even spicier with the defendant confessing to trying to woo her sister's man. Suppose supposedly because her sister told her to. This turns the courtroom into a full-blown circus, sparking a wild debate about respect, self-worth, and the kind of bonkers logic that seems to run in the family. The judge is more like a referee, trying to make sense of the sharing is caring marriage philosophy. You're gonna wanna see what's up next. It's a doozy. Get ready for the big drum roll as the paternity test steals the spotlight, naming Mr. Hill. We we took a DNA sample. That 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 is the truth. I for actually for showed- the girl, You also stated to the court, Ms. Hayes, that in all the years that you were together with Mr. Hill, he never got you pregnant. No. And the okay, other 25 right. women that he carried on with for long-term relationship. That's I am, what that is. I don't want your baby. I don't okay. want Kayla. I didn't say you wanted to have the baby. I said you wanted to have the baby taken from us. It's proven I, by your action. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Hill, you are her father. You can't just be involved with all these different men without doing Who, I'm not you. Just because you lay down with everybody who you talk to, because that's what you do. You and the Lord know you a slut. No, like you're hold a on, slut. Hold on, you're hold on, a hold slut. On. You're a Mr. slut. Mr. Snake, a liar, a cheat. And how is everything you don't that's know right. me? I don't know you. In five you. years, in you five have not years. got to know me, Katie. Yeah, that's right. Ever. Let's get some order. Right. And this, those are strong allegations, Miss Lopez. Very strong. Why are you saying that I'm the, I'm the father? She was like, I don't know. This is the I conversation heard this. This you is heard a conversation I with your own ears. With my own ears. This is not hearsay. I have a calendar when me and him did. Mr. Adel steps up, accusing Ms. Jones of tricking him into daddy duties with a plot twist. He's not the daddy. He's as shocked as a cat in a bathtub, realizing he might have signed up for a lifelong subscription to a kid that isn't his. The courtroom buzzes like a beehive at the drama unfolding. Ms. Jones, with the confidence of a cat with cream, swears up and down that Mr. Adel is the father. She's 100% sure amidst the chaos, making everyone lean in closer. It's like watching a soap opera live, but with more legal jargon. Plot twist, they're swingers, which throws a whole new level of spicy into the mix. They had one rule, swing together or not at all. But Ms. Jones went solo, and now it's a bigger mess. Mr. Adel, you are here today to prove Ms. Jones committed paternity fraud. You claim Ms. Jones duped you into signing her daughter's birth certificate only to find out after her child was born that she cheated prior to getting pregnant. You say she broke the terms of of your relationship. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Jones, you admit to cheating, but say you are 100% positive Mr. Adel is the biological father of your two-month-old daughter. Yes, Your Honor. So, Mr. Adel, what do you mean she broke the terms of the relationship? We have certain rules. We're swingers, you know, and, um... 
okay. And she cheated on me, and now she's trying to pin the baby on me. So wait, you have swinger rules? Yes, ma'am. What are the rules? What are the terms? You don't go outside of the relationship, uh, sexual relations with anyone outside of the relationship unless the other one is present. Okay. Did that just happen? One wild night, they decide to spice things up with a third player, turning their duo into a trio. It's like adding wasabi to your sushi. Exciting, but can backfire. The night was more tangled than headphones in your pocket, leaving everyone guessing who's connected to whom. Ms. Jones breaks the golden rule and goes for a solo adventure, leaving Mr. Adel out of the loop. It's like she played Monopoly, landed on his property, and refused to pay rent. She claims it was out of spite, turning their love game into a petty revenge plot, just when you thought it couldn't get more complicated. Hold on for the next Next curveball. That happened, you know, we uh, we invited the gentleman over. We had some drinks. She had told me that she was comfortable. After that, we we had we had give we had given her a body massage. Then uh, then we took her from there. We uh, he went on her. And Miss Joan, did you have intercourse with both men that night? Yes, you did. Yes. All right. Is this the night that was the basis of the paternity question? No. No. No, I was not present when she had when she had sex with this man. You know, I was present when she had sex with the guy that we invited over. I wasn't there when that other girl was And how did you even find out she invited someone over? She had told me. She came out and confessed to me that, that she cheated and the baby nut might not be mine. That hurts my feelings. So, Miss Jones, what happened with this other man? Why decide to have sex with this other man? Why? I felt neglected. He wasn't home. He would leave many hours of the night, sometimes even days. And when I would ask him where he was, he would tell me it's none of my business. I turned around and went out with one of his friends, had a couple drink, and one thing led to the next. We used the condom. I remember. Ms. Jones drops the bomb. She cheated. It's like she decided to add a plot twist in their already complicated relationship saga. Mr. Adley is as stunned as a mullet on a fishing boat, finding out only after they've been co-parenting for a month. The courtroom turns into a math class as they try to pinpoint the conception date. It's like they're plotting a treasure map, but the treasure is paternity truth. The debate over protection and dates makes everyone scratch their heads, wondering if they need a calculator or a crystal ball. Drum roll, please. I found out when we had an argument. She had confessed to me that she cheated. I was gone for uh, a night. Um, she had confessed to me the next day, and this happened just about last month, you know, and you know, now she finally tells me. But this was like a month ago? Yeah, the, the, this was a month ago that all this occurred that she had told me that she had cheated. And how has that affected you all at this point? We get along, but I, I just, I distance myself. I don't want to build any more of a relationship if I'm, if I'm not the father, you know, the, the, the real father needs to be. So if we look at this calendar, <laughs> August is the sex month. <laughs> you say that you had sex with the other man in the middle of August. Yes. You said you had sex with Mr. Adel when? Throughout the whole month. Throughout the whole month. Oh, end so that's why month. it's a sex the month. The end of the month. <laughs> One night with his friend, we had sex every night, unprotected. All the way into September, when he told me that he thought I was pregnant. The month of conception would be in August. Yes. That's when she was conceived. Yes. So that's right around the time you had sex with the other guy and with Mr. Adel. I used a condom with the other guy. I am 100% sure Josh is the father of Your Joshua. Honor, I... Mr. Adel, you are the father. I told you. The show kicks off with everyone settling down. Miss Jackson steps up, basically saying she's here to prove that her hubby didn't go around making babies elsewhere. The alleged other woman, Miss Lipscomb, is all in, claiming her baby definitely has Mr. Jackson's DNA. It's like an episode of Who's Your Daddy with higher stakes. Miss Jackson, you say you're here to confront your husband's mistress and to prove her one-month-old daughter, Kiasia, is not his biological yes, daughter. Yes, Your Honor. Furthermore, you say you learned today that the child is, in fact, your husband's. Your marriage is over. That's right, Your Honor. Can you believe what unfolded? Miss Jackson tells a tale of playing detective, sneaking around her husband's workplace, and then boom, she meets the girlfriend, Miss Lipscomb. It's like a bad rom-com scene where the wife and the girlfriend realize they're sharing the same man. Miss Lipscomb doesn't back down, insisting her baby is Mr. Jackson's mini-me. The audience is eating up the drama with a spoon. You won't want to miss what comes next in this saga. Miss Lipscomb, you say that you have no doubt your child is her husband's daughter. You claim he had sex with you, made a baby, and now she needs to 
deal with the truth. That's all right, Yana. Tell me, how did you find out your husband may be having a child with what? his mistress? Yana, let's talk about that. I got an epiphany. Call it woman's intuition, whatever you want. Just when you thought it couldn't get more intense, the courtroom turns into a verbal boxing ring with Miss Jackson and Miss Lipscomb throwing jabs about who's the real victim here. Mr. Jackson finally makes an appearance, looking like he'd rather be anywhere else. He admits to the affair, but plays it cool, making everyone wonder if he's the father or just a cameo in this baby drama. The judge is not amused, calling out Mr. Jackson for stirring the pot. Brace yourself. The revelation is just around the corner. Hold your breath. The paternity results are in, and Mr. Jackson is... I don't know what her intentions was when she came to that job. Why did she come up there, or why didn't she come up there? I was sitting up. How did you know her voice? Because when I'm around um, Mr. Jackson, and she calls, and the kids calls, that's how I know her voice is so high-pitched. I can hear her. Oh, she's a spell, Your Honor. Wow. Okay. So, it didn't dawn on me to ask, are you married now? Because if you're married now, why have you been living in a room for three to four months? So, so he never said my wife put money. me out? No, I never knew anything about a wife. Why am I walking my around with a ring marriage. on? But why do you wear a ring from a previous Thank marriage you. on the ring Common finger? Sense. He wear what he want to wear, he do what he want to do. Your Honor, but... AKA, she trifled. When it comes to one-month-old Keasia Jackson, Mr. Jackson, you are not the father. <laughs> Here we go again. Ms. Austin and Mr. Wallace are back in court, as if it were their favorite hobby. Ms. Austin claims Mr. Wallace is the dad of her kid, hoping he'll finally act like one. Mr. Wallace doubts he's the father, thinking Ms. Austin has too many friends. Previously, you were here because Mr. Wallace questioned the paternity of your other child, but now you find yourself in the same situation. Today, you say you need to prove to Mr. Wallace that he is the father of your nine-month-old son, Ronnell, so that he can begin to step up and be a father. Mr. Wallace, you claim you have multiple reasons to doubt when it comes to whether or not you are the biological father of this child and hope today is your last visit to this courtroom. It's like deja vu with a side of baby drama. Right off the bat, you won't believe this. The court turns into a circus when Mr. Wallace says he played detective with Ms. Austin's phone, but she calls his bluff. They start slinging mud faster than a pig in a puddle. The judge slams down her gavel like she's trying to win at whack-a-mole, reminding everyone this isn't a playground. It's like watching a soap opera, but everyone forgot their lines. Stay tuned, because the plot thickens and you'll be on the edge of your seat. This next part is a doozy. Mr. Wallace admits he's been ping-ponging between Ms. Austin and Ms. Roberts, making everyone dizzy. Uh, when we was together, I had installed, um, it was like spyware on her phone. It's what, um, they would duplicate her text messages and call logs and send a copy to my email. And again, for about the fifth, sixth time, I called her texting different men. Well, where your proof at? You saying that didn't happen? Where your proof at? I never saw it. And you believe she's sleeping with these men? Yes. Miss Austin, were you sleeping with these men? No. Lie detector to me, please, right now. How is <laughs> you can't just be involved with all these different men without doing Who I'm not you, just because you lay down with everybody who you talk to, because that's what you do. Me, you and the Lord know you a slut. No, like you're hold a on, slut. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You're a slut. You're a Mr. slut. I don't... We are going to speak to women respectfully in the courtroom. You can express yourself. <laughs> if I'm dead, so why you keep on sleeping with me? Why? 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 My... Why? I'm pregnant again. Why? Why? Easy accent. Why? Why? You say that about All her? Right. Yeah. Mrs. Matson claims Mr. Matson is the dad of their baby, but he's like, nah, you've been playing the field. They met at a casino where Mrs. Matson dealt cards, and Mr. Matson flirted while still on his wedding night with someone else. Fast forward, they got hitched while he was still married to the first wife. Talk about a two for one deal. Now, they're in court because Mr. Matson thinks his baby making days were over due to health issues, but surprise, baby makes three. Mrs. Matson, you say you are here today because you are determined to prove to your husband, Mr. Matson, that your six month old daughter is his biological child. You claim that he is trying to abandon your daughter and has a track record of doing so with other children. Now, Mr. Matson, you claim Mrs. Matson has been having affairs with other men throughout your marriage. He came into the casino that I was working in. I was a 21 dealer. He came in. What was the first thing I said to you? You asked me if I would like to be my next ex-wife. Yep. Is that what you said, Mr. Matson? Yes, Your Honor, it is. And then what happened from there? But he, when he married me, he was still married to her. Oh. That would be what we would call in the Big court me. illegal. Moving on. Happened, I had my first heart attack in 1997. I have a defibrillator. I've had many, many operations from then until now. Chances of me having kids are, are done. That's what so I was told I've by met, my doctor. You have been doctor. told that you cannot 
have exactly. children, you're sterile. His a, doctor was happy that he, we were having a baby. If he did a surgery I'm the first to that admit, said that he can't have player, kids, and I'm I've been with how many doctor. girls? And you're the He's only one that, that can. We were having okay. a kid together. It's coming home, getting drunk and coming home and at, babe, If you looked like that every point. night, I'd give it to you every night. <laughs> Tell me what you look like on a daily on a date. This roller coaster just went off the rails. Mr. Matson's proud of his wandering ways, while Mrs. Matson admits to a one-time affair because apparently Mr. Matson was too busy being supportive elsewhere. Their love story has more twists than a pretzel, with accusations flying faster than a blackjack dealer on a hot streak. Mrs. Matson tries to get a job, but Mr. Matson allegedly sabotages her chances by calling her crazy. The courtroom's heating up with more drama than a soap opera. Just when you think you've seen it all, the next scene takes the drama to new heights. And I have to ask you, have you ever cheated on him? One time, yes I did, because the owner of the company that we was working for died. His wife was taking his her husband's uh, death very hard. It's all about her and this company. Never came home. He was working all you the time. Half the time he was with her. I like Because I had women. been done with him. I was done. I was trying to leave him. He's got no backbone. I would have gave no you a flight ticket to get the hell out of here. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. You haven't seen anything yet. So Mr. Matson's sister, who's not a fan of Mrs. Matson, calling her every name in the book without actually knowing her. The sister accuses Mrs. Matson of being a liar and a cheat, which is kind of like the pot calling the kettle black in this family. The argument escalates to a point where the judge has to call in Jerome, the bailiff, to play referee. Meanwhile, everyone's forgetting about the baby amidst this battle of insults and accusations. But wait, the roller coaster of revelations is about to take another wild turn. The anticipation has been building up. The DNA results are in. What do I have to add? She's nothing but a snake, a liar, a cheat. And how is you don't know me? I don't know you. In five you. years, in you five have five not years. got to know me, Katie. Yep, that's right. Ever. Let's get Ever. some order. Right. I want to understand this. Those are strong allegations, Miss Lopez. She calls my mom's house and trying to look for my brother all the time because she doesn't trust him. That's why I don't even understand oh, why she's with me. us. We don't even and live in the same state. Mom's house, like, who are you? And my mom says, you're dead. And you expect me to have respect for a woman that's going to call my mom and say she's dead? Do you think Sandy is your brother's child? I don't think so. Not one of us in our family was born with red hair. The baby in the case of Madsen versus Madsen, Mr. Madsen, you are the father. Told you. you now you can time. apologize to me because I'm not the guy. You yeah. are apologizing. You're nothing to me. but a. You That's need to right. put your language down. Prepare for a twist that you didn't see coming. In the world's most awkward court episode, Ms. Ellis and Mr. Coger turn paternity drama into a primetime comedy. He claims their closest encounter was a failed attempt turned health class, while she's sure a brief fling led to their three-year-old. Cue Mr. Coger finding out about his potential mini-me on Facebook and sliding into DMs like a detective on a bad sitcom. Their back and forth could win a tennis match, all while the court watches this soap opera unfold, wondering if they're in court or a comedy club. The next moment will have you questioning if you're watching a court case or a reality TV show plot twist. Ms. Ellis, you claim you had a brief ling with the defendant three years ago. Soon after, you ended up pregnant, and now you hope to prove that he fathered your three-year-old son, Zamarian. Yes, Your Honor. I have to ask you, you're here in paternity court. Why do you oppose the test? Because we didn't have sex. We did not have sex. So he says. Okay. So we did. Yep. Tell me how you met. We would hang out. When we met, we, you know, we were cool. We would talk on the phone. There's nothing wrong with her. It was nothing wrong with me. We both was attracted to each other. We might want to go upstairs and, you know, fool around, mess around or whatever. So that's what happened. We, you know, took our time, walked up the steps, you know. Uh, I knew what was going to happen. I was hoping that it would happen. Have you questioning if you're watching a court case or a reality TV show plot twist? Just when you think it can't get any more bizarre, Mr. Coger's defense is a tangled web of bed wrestling without the actual wrestling. Claiming their intimacy was a no-go, Ms. Ellis drops a bomb, revealing a previous partner and a timeline that could rival a daytime soap opera. Their text exchanges read like a dramatic script, with Ms. Ellis playing hard to get with the truth and Mr. Coger playing detective on a case that's as clear as mud. The courtroom turns into a battleground of he said, she said, with Mr. Coger's wife jumping into the fray, defending her man with the fierceness of a lioness. The judge tries tries to steer this ship through stormy waters, but the waves of drama just keep coming, and you won't believe the twist that's about to come next. Had you been intimate with anybody else during the time you were with Mr. Coger? Yes, a, you week, had. Of, a week or so prior to the prior to us messing around, yes. So a week or so prior to you and Mr. Coger having the sex that you may not have had, mm -hmm. truth, or were you just no, saying... I just didn't want him involved. 
You, but I mean, why? I mean, because was, I was with somebody else, and they said that it was going to be there. So what's the point? What's the well, point? the point would be if he's the child's biological father, he would have a right to know, and so would the child. Standing is is not his child. I support my husband in the whole thing because there's no reason for him to lie about something that happened before we even got together. He called her in front of me and put it on speakerphone and he asked did her the he same incident. Did he tell he you we had sex her, in the car? Excuse, when you said that you were having a problem with your with your vagina or whatever, and she, she said yes, I remember that. Um, had this um, inquiry. Well, let me see this evidence, please. Me and my ex had sex. Okay. That week, but I know for a fact that following week, um, where the uh, car is, that we had sex that day, and we had sex in the car. You had sex in a car. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, now you exactly. left that piece of information mm -hmm. out. So the whole time when you say you were alone with him mm -hmm. and that was the second time. Hold on to your hats because the storm is about to break. As the saga continues, Mr. Koger brings his wife as a witness who doubles down on his innocence. Ms. Ellis, on the other hand, is ready with receipts, pulling out a calendar that could put Sherlock Holmes to shame. The court's atmosphere is electric with accusations flying faster than a speeding bullet and Mr. Koger's memory fog thicker than pea soup. And just when you think the plot can't thicken any further, the climax approaches, promising to shatter all expectations. The finale is upon us. The tension is palpable as the judge reads the DNA results. Um, my feelings are hurt for the same fact because I grew up in foster care. I didn't know my real mom until I turned 17. I don't want my son to grow up not knowing who his dad is. Zamarion, he, he's, he's old, you know, to know whether I'm his father or not. Do you have any relationship with him? I've never seen him. I, I just don't Never, know. ever seen I've him? i never seen him. Only through... Three years old? Yeah, three years old. Are you now saying in court that you did, in fact, have a sexual relationship no, with her? I'm Do you remember that. the car incident no, now? I'm not saying that. No, I'm not saying that. Pertaining to three-year-old Zamarian Johnson, Mr. Koger, you are Zamarian's father. Is your memory coming back now? Not at all. Not at all, Yana. Not at all. I don't have no reason to lie about it or...